I was good. I would have never guessed. So the movie yeah. man guy pours M and M's on his popcorn. <laughs> this too. What? No <laughs> people are going to recognize you with this. Is yeah. this new? I'm undercover. Yeah, this is new. My latest role in the movie. No, no, it's not. I just. <laughs> I, I have to admit, I, I hate you. I'm John Merkier, and I've always been inherently curious. Why is it that successful people succeed? Why do they thrive? What is it about those people? I'll introduce you to some of them, the movers and shakers, the difference makers in our community. Today, it's the Milwaukee movie man, who's really so much more, Greg Marcus. He is the president and CEO of the Marcus Corporation. We're at a Marcus Theater today. This is Mercurius. All right, Greg, thank you so much for having us in one of your theaters. God, thanks for coming. Glad to have I, I, I got to ask you, we're going to talk about all sorts of things because the Marcus Corporation's involved in a lot of things. But the movie theater part of it, how often are you in one of your theaters? Uh, I try to get here about once a week. You know, I, have, I have a date night with my wife, and I'm, I'm a huge movie fan. Who gets to choose the movie? Uh, I pick the movies. And she fully admits that I pick better. <laughs> <laughs> now, if you're here once a week, I mean, you're seeing roughly 50 movies a year. You must see most of what comes out that's worth anything. Uh, yeah, well, it's I see half of what's worth anything because I'm going to assume that everything we play is worth something. <laughs> and we, we actually we probably play over 200 pieces a year. Wow. So close to 200. So I probably see about, in truth, at the end of the day, probably 25 to 30 okay. percent of what it is. That, that's a, that is a broad uh, set of releases that when I, when I get to 200, I'm talking about, you know, alternative content, things like that. Uh, let's talk about the snacks. Uh, I got to ask you, as a guy who's in the theater a lot, do you have a favorite snack? Do you have a routine when you come into the theater, what you eat and drink? I, I do, actually. It's, it's, it's dependent on what time I'm here. Okay. So if I'm here around dinner time, I'll grab a Zafiro's pizza, okay. and I will. Uh, and we have these really ingeniously designed boxes that are I came up with for the theater, right? and that they open in the middle. So if you think about how a typical pizza box opens, it flips open which is not very nice to the person in front of you or around you, and it's sort of unwieldy. And ours are split down the middle, and they open up, so you can open up one side and eat your pizza, and so it's really very convenient. So I have to, I'm a big double onion pizza fan. I oh. have no friends, apparently. Uh, <laughs> my poor wife, <laughs> the double onions. The, uh, you picked the pizza and the movie. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, she lets me eat the pizza by myself. <laughs> and so we, uh, so, so we sit and eat a pizza and then some salad or some zucchini fries if it's dinner time. Uh, if it's another time and I can get myself, I am a big pop. I haven't had a popcorn addiction for many years. <laughs> and so I like to get popcorn. I like to put, I have a little secret. M&M's on my popcorn. Wait, M&M's? Yeah. Seriously, M&M's on the popcorn? M&M's, yeah. It's, uh, it's, we have some here, actually. Yeah, yeah. And I can explain this to you. So it's the concept of, you know, sweet and salt go together. Right. Every, I think people know that. Chocolate, you think of chocolate-covered potato chips, you know, yeah. that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, caramel corn is sweet and salt. Yeah. And so M&M's go perfectly on popcorn because you get the chocolate and the salt from the popcorn uh, but the chocolate doesn't melt into the popcorn because it's candy coated, oh. and then the and the warm ones end up at the bottom, and so and it does spread out. So here, I'm gonna actually, so I'm gonna do right this. On there? You just yeah, you just do that. You know, I, I may not usually pour the whole thing on at once because <laughs> I want to have it last throughout yeah. the movie, but it's gonna make a much better visual here if we pour them all on at once. But go for it, give it a shot. And I just kind of mix them in there and yeah. grab a little handful. Yep, there you go. That's it. And I'm gonna do it too because we're sitting here, and how can I not? Oh, you're it's sweet and salty. Yeah. I, was good, I would have never guessed. So the movie yeah. man guy pours M and M's on his popcorn. Yeah, and I never. I'll, I know exactly where it was. Man, thirty years ago, and I was in Boston, and I was with a friend, and his girlfriend said, "Oh, you should put M and M's in your popcorn." And I thought, "That's nuts. That's the goofiest idea I ever heard." And she said, "Come on." And we did it, and I've been hooked ever since. Okay, so your wife does she like the M and M's in the popcorn too? She does. Everybody does. <laughs> I do. <laughs> I do too. Does it work the same with peanut M and M's? Uh, I'm assuming it does. I'm not a peanut fan, <laughs> so I can't tell you for sure. <laughs> How about drink? Do you, your theaters are full service bar. You have every soft drink you could imagine. Again, depends on when I'm here. Long day, I might have a beer or a glass of wine. <laughs> Unwind. <laughs> uh, it's been a tough day. Uh, but uh, otherwise, you know, I'm just a soda guy. I'm not, I mean, we know people they, they, who like to, like, literally sit under the fountain, wear a Pepsi house, so I'll drink Diet Pepsi, yeah. you know, because yeah. i got to drink Diet Pepsi. Because what makes more sense than Diet Pepsi and M&M's in your popcorn? <laughs> <laughs> i got to ask you a couple questions about the theater because it's been such a revolution, such an evolution, and you guys have led the way. These dream loungers that we're sitting in, I remember the first time I sat in one, and it was in the Menominee Falls, Marcus. And I absolutely loved it. I thought it was the coolest thing ever. Has this been a big deal? Oh, man. It's, it's reshaped the industry in a lot of ways. 
I'm sorry, I'm going to have to pause because, or you're going to have to just take these movies away from me because I will sit here and eat them the whole time. The, uh, yeah, the recliners. So it's, it's really an interesting dynamic. You know, you take out half the seats in a theater. It goes to show you how under-occupied we were. Mm -hmm. Um, and you put these in because it's, you know, one almost takes up the space of two, of two original kind of seats, regular upright seats. But it's, it's such an attractive way to see a movie and it changed the whole experience to make it, in a way, somewhat more home-like, but home-like with an insanely great screen and great food and great popcorn and great, you know, great amenities around you. Because the interesting thing is, even though we have what we call stadium seating, the different levels, as you see looking up, mm-hmm. th- that was designed originally to get people better viewing angles to the screen. The, uh, you know, with a recliner, you actually don't need stadium seating very much. You yeah. could go with a sl- sloped floor. They had yeah. this old sloped floor theater. Now, to convert a sloped floor theater to stadium seating, to risers, is very expensive. And so they didn't, it was an old, tired theater. They didn't know what to do with it. Mm-hmm. So they said, someone said, why don't you put recliners in your movie theater? And so they put recliners in the theater. And it was a huge success. I mean, it was, a, it was absolutely crazy. And someone had told me, you got to go see what's going yeah, on there. Yeah. And so we went out there and we checked it out. I thought, this, this is really interesting. And the theater was absolutely booming. So much so that we went to a competitive theater in this market. And... There were some policemen who were at this other theater, and they were just more of a presence. It was I don't know if it was the why they, but they felt they needed somebody there. And I uh, was talking to the policeman. And I said, you know, because I wanted to understand a little bit about this other theater. I said, yeah. can you tell? I said, do you know this this other theater? You know, and he's like, yeah. I said, is it, what kind of neighborhood is it? Is it a, you know what kind of demographics does it have? And he's talking to me. Oh, and he says. Oh, that theater. That's the theater that's killing this theater that he's in. And I'm like, that okay, if the policeman understands <laughs> yeah. the economics of the business, there really is something important here. <laughs> You're going back. I'm going back. You're going all the way. Yeah. You're really chilling. Yeah. Just... And the truth is, you want to sit a little bit lower in the auditorium with the better seats. You, the, people would think, no, I want to get more up. But the, yeah. really, because you're going back, the best angle is to be just a little bit lower. You know? Yeah, I guess that makes sense. And it makes our first row seats much better. In the old days, oh, those yeah. were really a punishment because you're yeah, looking yeah, like yeah, this, yeah. right? Yeah. But now, when you're in the, even in the first row, you, you lean back and you, you relax. When you come to the theater, it's a, I've always found this dynamic so interesting. There's so many things that go beyond just seeing the presentation on a large screen. It's that you're coming in with a group of people mm-hmm. to experience something together, and yet you're by yourself. Yeah. You're sort of in your own little sort of cocoon for a couple hours, ex- except you're maybe sharing the experience with somebody near you. And then at the end, you walk out and you talk about it, and, you, and, yeah. and it becomes a it's point a of shared discussion. thing. I used to have a boss who would leave in the middle of the day. If he was having a really stressful time at work, his respite would be that he would leave in the middle of the day and he'd go see a movie. Oh. He would take a little longer lunch and he would go see a movie that started at 1130 and he'd be gone for a couple of hours and we all knew that's what he did and that was his way of getting away from it all and he would be locked in, concentrating on the movie, lost, enjoying himself, and then he could come back and refocus and that was his deal. Yeah. I think there's a little bit of that in all of us. You know, whether it's whether it's uh, doing what my boss did or at night, it's just an escape, isn't it? Isn't it still an escape for people? Yeah, that's, and you can't, you know, when you're at home, yeah, you can watch good product at home and you're gonna have a giant TV and you can have a good sound system, but you can't stop your phone from going off and your dog from barking and the phone from ringing yep. and the, yep. you know, all the different things that become distractions that in the theater, you're pretty much not gonna get distracted by. And so it's really easy to get to make have it be that kind of escape and to and to really experience something in a different way that you just can't get at home. I don't, I don't care how great your sound system is. So let's talk about at home. Netflix, streaming services, are they your biggest competitors? Um, you know, the the, the at home experience, yeah, I call I actually what I say is our biggest competitor is the couch. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, we have to be able to motivate people to get off the couch. And there's this tug of war that's going on. You know, the more content that is poured into somebody's house, the more reasons they could have not to leave. Mm-hmm. And so we have to create an experience. And that's what we've done with recliners and pizza and beer and wine and drinks and burgers. Our burgers are 
so good. People would never expect how good our food is. I think they're surprised. Maybe around here people know about it. Yeah. But you know, movie theater food can be viewed as well. That's just movie theater food. Mm-hmm. But I would have to admit, I was in one of our competitors, and they had sort of their menu up. It wasn't yeah. here in Milwaukee. It was somewhere else. And I said, to, and it looked awful. And I, I said to the person working by the counter, is the food as bad as it looks? And they're like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It really is. <laughs> and, and ours is not that way. And, and so, you know, we're tr- we, we have to give people a reason, though, to get off their couch and, and come here. Uh, and and I think we do a good job, but it's a constant battle, and it's it's too easy to just sit there, you know. But I always have a saying, you know, as long as there's 16 year olds, someone's going to be the house. <laughs> <laughs> so we're Should movies that are on Netflix or Amazon Prime be eligible for Oscars? You know, uh, not on bias, but no, I, I really don't think so. You know, the uh, the the idea about the movies is it's not just it's, just, it's not just, it's not just a story. It's an experience. Mm-hmm. And if you don't play it in the theaters, then a piece of what we just talked about mm-hmm. is lost. And so, you know, if, if you want to be a movie on TV, that's great. You should get an Emmy. Mm-hmm. If you want to be, and that, that, that's, an Emmy is not a bad thing. I mean, I, I, I'd like an Emmy. Someone would give me one. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, I, but, I, but I think that you know, but but these companies that are trying to get these awards, they're not they're not doing it to win an award. They're doing it to make them to enrich themselves. Yes. And so, uh, I would think it'd be better if they would, uh, what we call have a window, give us the period of exclusivity. And it's so interesting, you know. There's this. It's 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 the it's the one chance they have to highlight their movie in a way that you can't anywhere else. You know, there's this debate. I'm sure they're saying, well, am I better off having it exclusive to my mm-hmm. service that you can't really see it in the theater, you can only see it here, and so we'll get customers for that. For serialized TV, I think that makes a lot of sense, and it brings up an interesting point. You know, there's this whole dis- this whole discussion about, uh, should you drop a series, or should you let it come right. out over time? Right. And... You know, because I can binge watch if I drop it. Yep. But one of the things they lose when they drop it is the the what we call what we just talked the water cooler talk. Mm-hmm. You can't because if they drop it, if you watch that, if you spend the first weekend, you watch the whole series. Now, and I'm watching it maybe over a few weeks. How many times have you been with someone? Wait, 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 don't ruin don't, it. Don't don't tell me yep. what happens. Yep. yep. Well, now I can't yep. even talk about it with you. Yep. But yep. I don't know. I'm two. I'm two. Yep. Two episodes into Curb. I don't know if you watch Curb. Your enthusiasm, no, no, I haven't seen that. It's very hard to watch. It's a great. <laughs> film, but I'm two episodes in. If you watch, you and I could talk about it because they're releasing them one a week. And some, so some, yeah. some of these services have recognized they're better off in terms of building word of mouth and building discussion if they do it over time. That dropping it all at one time is not exactly the best thing to build value in their content. You know, the funny thing is, what are the series that are selling for the most money? What are the most expensive series now on these services that they're having to buy? They're buying Friends and The Office yep, yep. and Big Seinfeld. Bang Theory. And, I mean, yeah, yeah. These are series that are decades old. Yeah, yeah. But why? First of all, they hadn't fragmented the TV yet. You so said there was when you, you know, on Thursday night, you watched. Yep. You know, that you was a big deal. Must see TV. Must see TV. So everybody was watching the same thing. Everybody came in and talked about it. You don't get that dynamic anymore. And so now, if. The theaters, in a way, are an analog to that. And if you put your movie in the theater, you now build this ability to talk about it and for everybody to talk about it. And I think that that builds more value for your for your streaming service than just dropping it on the streaming service. And so uh, we're a big proponent of trying to talk to these guys and say, guys, you know, yeah, it sounds like a good idea to, to bypass the theaters. But it probably sounded like a good idea to drop the series one time too, and not you know there there are some reasons why people have what they why they do what they do and why 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 practices were established. The next big thing in movie theaters. Look into your crystal ball. You don't have to have a crystal ball. I mean, you're living this every day. What's the next big thing that we don't have right now or don't realize is a possibility? I, I think it's going to be. And it's look, the big thing just happened in a way. It's this. It's this atmosphere with the recliners. If you think about it, you know, that's a huge investment for us. Mm-hmm. And so, stadium seating. When we went from sloped floors mm-hmm. to stadium seating, was a big investment. Well, that was you know. 
25 years ago, and then you fast forward 20 years and this starts yep. to happen. So there's not a new big thing every year. But what I do think that we'll get better at, and I think is going to be, it's going to be our ability to build a relationship with our customers you know, through our loyalty clubs, things like that. You know, we, for 80 years in our company, our company's in our 85th year, or 85th, well, our 85th birthday will be in November. For 80 years, we didn't know who came to the theaters. We had no idea. You came up, you paid cash, maybe you gave your credit card, and then you went and sat down. We couldn't tell you anything about you. But now, if you're in the loyalty club, you get a discount, but then we also get to learn about what you like. And then that allows us to let you, and to, to tell you what's going on and what you like. And I think that we're going to also get better at, at, Providing you information that you find relevant and, and, and building a relationship with you. I, I, it's funny, I was talking to people one day and I said, you know, wouldn't it be great? I, mean, we, I said, we have a business where people really are passionate about the product. I said, now, look, they're, they're not tattooing themselves with your product. It's like Harley. I mean, they tattoo themselves and they're like, and I, and I said, but we're just darn good. And after this meeting, and I was, so I was making the point that we need to work to build the relationship with our customers since we know about them and provide them things that they like. You know, wouldn't you like to get an email after you saw 1917 and say, here's what happened and this was real or this wasn't real? I would. Yeah, I would and, too. And if we knew, and, and we, and, and you will start to get to that point, but, um, but I walked out of that meeting after sort of giving the speech and I wrote everybody an email after and said I was wrong because actually our customers do tattoo our product onto themselves because someone in that email trail probably had a Yoda tattoo. <laughs> There's lots of Disney yeah, tattoos. Lots of Disney tattoos, yeah. lots of Superman tattoos. <laughs> That's true. And so That's people true. actually do tattoo themselves with our product. So you can't ask for a more passionate audience. <laughs> and we have to become better at connecting with that passion. I want to ask you another question about the hotel industry. So it's the Marcus Corporation. You guys are, amongst other things, the movie business, the hotel business, the restaurant business. Is one more difficult to run or to wrap your arms around? Is there a way to, to qualify what running each division is like? Um, no, they're... they're they're very, they're very, there's some similarities and some differences. In the movie theaters, first of all, you know, it's, it's a, a replicatable model. You're, mm -hmm. you know, you're at least the way, the way we do hotels and theaters in a way. So the movie theaters are very replicatable. They are relatively similar from market to market. We make a decision, we put in a take five lounge, it works. Well, we mm -hmm. can do them everywhere. Mm -hmm. Hotels in the full service arena where we play, they tend to be more different. Each one is different. The assets are larger. The, mm -hmm. the management teams are are uh, yeah. You need a larger management team mm -hmm. in a larger asset like that, and so and with the you know now theaters are getting more complicated as we've added food and beverage. Mm -hmm. We are making the theaters more. I mean, my my joke about you know like HR in a theater. You know, in a theater was our biggest cha HR challenge years ago was just not having enough zit cream in the employee break room. I mean, <laughs> that that was our that was our biggest thing, right? The in a hotel. I mean, you know, you've got the, the, the employee base can be very diverse. I mean, you've got immigrants, first time jobs. Yeah. Um, you've got college kids who are probably make some money on the side, whether it's working the front desk or working, you know, maybe in the restaurants. You've got uh, you've got um, uh, salespeople out, so sophisticated salespeople out selling the, the hotel. And so you have a much more diverse, complex uh, employee base again getting a little more complicated mm -hmm. in the theaters mm -hmm. as we've added the food and beverage, but still a lot like the hotels. Um, St. Kate, our most recent hotel, you know, and that's completely that's completely different. I mean, we build a theater. Yeah. You know, you know, we 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 take. There's the risk of well, will it is it in the right location? Mm -hmm. Is there too much competition or not too much competition? You know, those are the risks in building a new theater. You build a hotel with a new concept. Well, that obviously has a whole other. That's a level. big risk. Another, another risk, yeah. How come you don't have these, by the way? Yeah, uh, I, I need these all the time. I mean, you're just over there, you know, looking at everything. Yeah, you don't need these. Uh, no, I don't actually. I'm, I mean, I, I, my hair is going away, but I can still see. Which is really bad. I can look in the mirror and see how much hair I've lost. It's really a bummer. Um, <laughs> yeah, no. this too. What? Yeah. Most people aren't going to recognize you with this. Is yeah. this new? I'm undercover. Yeah, this is new for my latest role in the movies. No, no, it's not. I just. 
I, I have to admit, I, I hate shaving. And so when I go on vacation <laughs> at Christmas time, I, uh, yeah. I, I have a couple of weeks and I stop shaving. Yeah. And usually I, it's funny. I never, ever had a beard my whole life. And <laughs> last year we went away and I came back and I had a beard. Yeah. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to go in the office with this because it is going to freak everybody yeah. out. <laughs> and I was doing it partly for fun, but partly, you know, it sort of relates to the same Kate. We have to be thinking about new ways of doing things, and you don't want, you have to change. You know, we have a saying in our business, the only constant is change. And so I'm living it, right? So I want to change my Does face. your wife like the beard? She actually does. That's probably why I still have Yeah, exactly, because that's the real deal, right? Whether, whether or not your wife likes it. How should a person handle criticism? Uh, well, I mean, there's a few, you know, it's a couple of things. One is you have to ask yourself, you know, is it, can I learn from it? Did I do something wrong that I can learn from? That's usually the first thing I do. Other times it has to be in perspective. It's really interesting. It's funny, you know, these ads that go on the screen and I, uh, and I have to admit that I, you know, I'm on Twitter and people mm -hmm. every once in a while will tweet something not so nice at mm -hmm. me and they'll do it at my hashtag, you know, or my at, my mm -hmm. at Greg Loves Movies. And usually it's like after midnight and they're drunk. And then they write yep. something really sort of nasty. And then I wake up in the morning and it's gone because they woke up and said, wow, <laughs> I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> now, so I've been doing these now. We started off, this started because of the United Way. We started doing these. They had, I had never had never been on the screen before. And the United Way yeah. person was sort of getting the Greg show. And they're like, you know, you would you go and do the appeal on screen? And I'm like, well, I never thought about it. I always wanted to figure out how to personalize the experience in a way, you know, because as great as our theaters are and everything that we do, people really come here for Superman and for Batman mm -hmm. and for Star Wars and for Knives Out and mm -hmm. Jumanji. They're coming here for what we put on the screen, mm -hmm. not for me. But I always wanted, and so, and so what is Marcus? So you know, around here people know, but especially, you know, we're in 17 states, you know, they, they, they may not have any clue what that is. It's just a name yeah. of a building. And so being able to be out there was something that I thought would be interesting. I said, well, if I can welcome people, mm -hmm. if you're okay with that, I'll do the mm -hmm. thing. And so we started doing them. And so now after about five years, it had been five years, and I'd seen what I saw on my Twitter account. One day, for some reason, I decided to search just my name. Oh, man. Have you ever seen that Kimmel bit where they do, you know, mean tweets? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I have them. Yeah. <laughs> I, I read, I read the, uh, I, re I started reading them, and I'm like, oh, what, why am I doing this? Mm -hmm. Everyone hates me. Mm -hmm. And I was pretty much in the fetal position, catatonic for a weekend, <laughs> laying in my house thinking, I, this is all, I mean, what? And then, and my point about having perspective, well, how do you handle criticism? Well, then I need to have some perspective. Well, first of all, is what they're saying, right? I don't, most of them, it's not, it's a bunch of, that's right. But, yep. you know, what I then thought about was, oh yeah, we must show this to about five to 6 million unique customers mm -hmm. a year. If, 2% to 5 million aren't really into what I'm doing. Then that's 100,000 people who feel they might want to vent on Twitter and say that what they think about me and add a few expletives. Um, and, and so I, uh, I, uh, I don't, I don't, um, I try to not let, I, I, once I got that in perspective and I said, well, if I'm going to put myself out yeah. there, I'm going to have to, to accept that. And I try generally not to respond. Um, you know, I know there's a, but, but every once in a while, I can't stop myself. I know. I mean, some woman wrote, you know, the, probably the craziest one we ever did is where I was lip syncing opera on the screen, which was, I was, I thought was pretty funny, but, and, but it got a lot of reaction. Like, you know, you look like an idiot. And, uh, I, uh, and, and somebody wrote, I'd rather go to, I'd rather, I'd rather go to jail for illegally downloading a movie than listen to Greg Marcus sing opera again. And so I wrote, I, I couldn't resist. I wrote, and again, she thought I'd never see it because she didn't actually tweet at me. She just wrote my name in the tweet. Uh -huh. And I wrote, well, I said, first of all, it's not worth going to jail for. <laughs> Second of all, I'm not really singing. <laughs> you do know that's not me singing, yeah. right? <laughs> I, was, I think she was shocked that I actually that even responded. That she heard from she, you. You probably want to go, yeah. oh, my God. One guy wrote, and, the, and this is, and again, I don't do this very often, but I, I probably had a glass of wine, and I'm sitting there reading one. Every once in a while, I go and look just for kicks. Sure. And uh, they wrote, do you think Greg Mark, because, okay, so what happens is there's a bunch of kids who like to take sna to sna Snapchats of me on the screen, and then they'll write, you know, daddy or <laughs> asterisk, asterisk, you know, something, or, yeah, uh, you know, yeah. well, I love you, Greg, or they'll write nice things, too. Yeah. I don't know, because I never see them, right? 
but I know that it happens. My kids get them. And I said, Dad, you're on this guy. I know. So the uh, so I one guy wrote, "Do you think Greg Marcus knows how done dirty he is on Snapchat?" And I just responded, "Yup." <laughs> I'm so sorry, Greg. I'm like, don't worry about it. I knew he was not expecting that. No. <laughs> uh, which human characteristic do you admire the most in a person? Oh man. Uh, which are the most? Um, I, I think it's. I, I have to sort of say it's a combination of things. It's, it's having intellect, and yet, being sensitive, and 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 it's, it's about I, I, perseverance. My dad is the most tenacious human I've ever seen. You would never. If you spent any time with my dad, he comes off as the most laid back, you know, smiling. You know, he's. He's and, and yet he is he's he's unbelievably tenacious. You know his whole sculpture Milwaukee project. He wanted sculptures in downtown Milwaukee, and he smiles all the way. But but he has not lost focus on making that happen. And it's not just that; it's our business. It's anything that if I come to him with a problem, I got to be prepared for a long discussion because he's really going to dig in and be thoughtful about it. And he has intellect, and he is sensitive. So I sort of I guess what I'm saying is I really uh, I'm. I'm a fan of my dad. <laughs> you can have one person to have dinner with who you've never met before. Who would that person be? One person who I, uh, oh man, who I've never met, who I would like to have dinner with. Um, wow, that's a, uh, you know, I would probably have to say Christopher Nolan. Now, he's made some of my favorite movies in recent years. I mean, I go back to Memento, uh, you know, which, uh, is, which is a movie most people haven't seen. I was so into Memento um, that I thought when I saw it that it was... It was a movie about someone who didn't have a short-term memory. I don't know if you've seen this movie. No, I'm familiar with it, but I've not seen it. And, and, and it's shot in a way the sequences aren't in aren't in aren't in chronological order. I thought it was shot back to front, like it starts at the end and ends at the beginning. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I know I'm not the only person that did this, but when it came out on DVD, this was probably 15 years ago. I went and bought the DVD right away because I wanted to watch it in sequential order, chronologically. Yeah, yeah. And what I figured out pretty quickly was it's not back to front. It starts at the beginning and the end, and it meets in the middle. I mean, it's so interesting. You're an accomplished pianist. What has piano taught you that's not related to music? Um, Well, first of all, it's taught me that youth is wasted on the young because (laughs) I learned when I was a kid, I played growing up, I was okay, and I'm, and, I'm, and I'm not the greatest piano player, but I could play, and I could, and I had enough talent that my mom basically wouldn't let me quit. She let my brothers quit, but she would not let me quit, and she said, you just got to stick with it. My grandfather on my mom's side was a great jazz piano player, and so, you know, I was into that, and, and so she just made me stick with it, so I did, and then I went to college, and I took a few classes. I went to Indiana University, which has one of the best music schools in the country, and so I took some classes while I was there, and I always, I never stopped playing. But so after college until about 13 years ago, actually, I sort of was playing the same thing over and over again. And I was sort of sick of what I was hearing. And I called up my friend Bill Boniface, who is one of the leading office brokers in town, if not the leading office broker in town. And I said, Bill, and he's a guitar player. And I said, Bill, I need to find someone to work on jazz with. And he said, I got the great, the perfect guy for you. And I got hooked up with a guy named Mark Davis, who is as it turns out now, he's one of my best friends, but as a tremendous musician and an educator. He's written a couple of books, and he's actually just starting a new thing, the Milwaukee uh, Jazz Institute, and he's he's uh, gonna he's 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 a big he's a, a great player, and 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 the benefits of the music to kids and learning music, mm-hmm. and uh, and how beneficial that is. And even for adults, and it's been a great experience for me. But what I learned was, man, I wish I would have practiced more when I was a kid because I do not have the time. I mean, I still I play every day, and even if I could, even if it's just 15 minutes, I sit at that piano and I work on whatever wow. I'm working on. Yeah. And uh, but I could sit there for hours now, and I would love to just have hours to practice. And yeah. Now I can't. So what I yeah. learned very quickly was youth was wasted on the young. <laughs> <laughs> so I had never played the piano in my life, and for my 40th birthday. I told my wife, I don't know why, but I feel like I want a piano. And so my, my wife bought me a baby grand piano for my 40th birthday, and I'd never played the piano before. Oh, wow. And so my hardest thing was finding then a woman who would come to my house 
and teach me piano because most people want you to go to their house for the piano lessons when you're a kid and all that stuff. And it taught me patience. And I'm not a very patient person. But man, when you play the piano or probably any instrument, you have to be patient. Yeah. And it's yeah, not easy to be patient. Yeah. I, no, no. And it, it teaches you about, if you play with other people, it teaches you about teamwork. Yeah. Um, it teaches you someone, what it was the, uh, it, the, the, you know, it teaches you about going to patience, you know, the line of he who practices the most wins. You know, and, that's, yeah. and it's yeah. true. It's almost There's anything. not a shortcut, is there? No, there is no shortcut, and they were talking about no in any in any endeavor. You know, the whole, there's been a lot of discussion about Kobe lately, with Kobe Bryant mm-hmm. and his passing, and uh, how nobody worked harder. Yeah. I mean, yeah. so here he had incredible talent, obviously, and then what it really distinguished him because when you're at that level, right? I mean, these guys all have them. They, they, exactly. I promise you, they all have a different set of yeah. wiring that I ever got, and whatever that endeavor, even in music. I mean, there are people who I know just got a different set of wiring, and yet. The people who really typically stand out are the ones who really work hard. So the benefit of hard work, working with other people, um, learning about the ability to make mistakes, how to make mistakes, you know, not worrying about it, just keep 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 going on. You know. Are you a nap guy? Ah, uh, no, I'm not. I would like to be. I just don't have time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, waiting for that in, right? Uh, last good book you read that really stands out. Uh, last good book I read that stands out. Um, Oh, uh, there, I, I read a book um, called Nudge, which you know it's it's about um, it's about uh, the um, how to behave. I'm into behavioral economics. I like Freakonomics. The show, the, the the podcast, Freakonomics, and it's about the idea of how you get people to how how they get people to do things. You know, the idea of the default choice. It's the, the human nature of inertia, right, is that if you put the default choice there, mm-hmm. you know, in that list of things that mm-hmm. you want someone to do, they will typically pick the default choice. Mm-hmm. You know, how you place something in a, in a stack, how they might pick. The most, and they talk about the studies of how other people can make something happen. This, the, the, the part of the book that's blew me away to this day was, this goes to why focus groups are really, you have to be very careful with the information you get from focus groups. It's important, you can use them, but they did an example of, they put a plant in a focus group and they held up a card and they said, you know, do you like this, you know, the, what, what, do you, what do you think of this? And the guy says, that's the most beautiful blue dress I've ever seen. And it's red. And he was resolute about it and he went first. And the number of people that agree with him was frightening. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And so yeah, <laughs> it was mind boggling, like <laughs> shocking. <laughs> and so the, I, I found that very interesting. I've been reading a book called The Big Picture um, that's about the movie industry and and, uh, and and where it's going. And and so I'm, I guess I'm tending to read stuff that's, that's, yeah. that's nonfiction. I like fiction. I wish I had more time to read. I'm, I, I like to read, but I have... You know, there's only so many hours in that, that day. There's piano to practice. And that is exact. The truth is, piano practice is a, has you know is like a conscious decision. Well, I'm, yeah. I I have, I have a ton of reading for work, yeah. so I can't just I can't pick up a book. I tend to read magazines and periodicals. And... Do you primarily pay with cash, the credit cards? Uh, credit cards. I keep some cash because it's pocket. easier, or because you like to collect the points. Why? Uh, I collect the points. Yeah, you know what? And, and I and I just. I typically don't walk around with much cash yeah. in my book. Yeah. I don't either. <laughs> Just enough for the valet and the yeah, tip. That's exactly really, that's that is exactly about it, right. right. You're a generous philanthropist. Why is that important to you? Why does that matter? Uh, two reasons. Um, one, and I talk about this. This is because we, I've had, you know, with the people we talk about this a lot. Why, what, what is our motivation? First of all, because it's the right thing to do. If you have the capability, you have the responsibility. And my mom always said, you can't be a taker of the world. And so it starts there. But I can't tell you that it's 100% altruistic because it's especially true of our businesses. Our businesses are immovable. The Fister mm-hmm. cannot be moved. The St. Kate cannot be moved. The Theater cannot be moved. The North Shore, the Majestic. You cannot move these buildings. Mm-hmm. So if you can't move your business, you better have a strong community. And because if people don't want to come, if you don't take care of your community, people aren't going to want to live in your, community, in your community. People aren't going to want to visit your community. And if you don't have that, well, then you don't have people to work. 
in your in your establishments. You don't have people to come and patronize your establishments. You don't have people who want to come to your city and patronize your establishments. And so if you don't take care of your community, then it's really going to be a negative on your business. And so, as I said, starting with is the right thing to do, but also it also is it's the right thing to do for your business. So This is tied to that. What's the best part about living in the Milwaukee area? Um you know, it's interesting. We were, I was talking to somebody about this last night just because he, he's moved here. He's recently started working for us, and he was saying how much he likes it here And when we were talking about. And I always say, I can't think of another place I'd rather live. I cannot think about it. I can think of some places I'd like to go in the middle of winter. Sure. But I think, oh, could I live somewhere else? Where would I, If I could live anywhere else, where would I pick? And I can't really figure that out. And I think it's, you know, I, I believe I have this sort of philosophy that life is a series of trade-offs, you know, Um if I choose to live here, well, I have winter, right? Um, but I have, I have a, a community where I can have impact, and I have it's it's and people here are unbelievably nice, and and genuinely nice. I've lived on both coasts. I went to law school in the out east. Mm-hmm. I went to film school out west, mm-hmm. and I have good places to be. Um, but there's something about you know, uh, you know, about being here that's a very genuine kindness. It was a great place to raise the family. The kids are grown now, but a great place to raise the family um, because you you get good values, hard work, you know, not too ostentatious. Um, And the, the, you, you, we've got great culture. We've got, we've got great, you know, great, great sports teams. I mean, you know, I'm a diehard Packer fan, diehard Brewer fan, diehard Bucks fan. I mean, I, so I, you get great world class, you know, major league sporting. You, so you have all that. We, we punch above our weight in culture, whether it's music or theater. I mean, I was at the Rep the other night, saw mm-hmm. a fantastic show. I've seen so many great shows there. The Marcus Center has great shows. Um, now, is it as much? As in a quantity basis, as if you went to a, a larger city, a Chicago, New York. No, it's not. But we still get access. I saw Hamilton here. I mean, exactly. It was, and it was a great show. Yeah. And so, um, you know, it's we don't have as much, but it's and, and it's you know what? It's easy to get around. Yeah. You know, I don't have to sit in traffic for an hour. I don't want to sit in traffic for no. an hour. You can't practice the piano if you're sitting in traffic. No, that's exactly right. <laughs> that's, ex- <laughs> that's exactly right. So, what's the biggest challenge we have uh, as a community? Our, our central city, it is that is we, we, we have got to, and and frankly and even you know the education system, it's really a bunch of things. It's the uh, it's it's the at the end it's it's evidencing itself in um, economic challenges, right? But it really it it, it starts it, it, that that's that's the effect, not the root cause. The root cause is not enough jobs. The root cause is an education system that's not serving all the all the kids in a way that needs to do that. Now, and that's not something that's going to be fixed overnight. It's going to take, take generations to get to this place. And if you think about it, if you said, I want to, I want to fix the, the education system, and a lot of people do it, nobody even has the answer. I can't tell you I have the answer. Mm-hmm. Um, but we can't stop trying because you know, I grew up in a, in a family that said, you know, my grandfather and my father, you know, what's, there was no question I was going to, to school after college, there was, you know, and get a profession. I mean, it was, it was just, you know, it's so important. It's so important ultimately to success. And we have to, it's our kill. It's our, it's our community's Achilles heel. And we've got to stay at it and fix it so that everyone can participate in our, in our economic success. All right. I want to wrap it up. by I like to do this. It's called deserted Island. So the premise is, Greg, you're on a deserted island, and you have a series of choices. On the deserted island... By the way, I'm a lawyer. I'm horrible with choices. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you're a recovering lawyer. <laughs> you're on the deserted island. You can take one movie. It's the only movie you're going to be able to ever watch on the deserted island. What's the one movie? Um, I would probably take Blazing Saddles. <laughs> You'll have a good time. Yeah, no, I'll watch it again and again. <laughs> yeah, no, it's such a great movie. On the deserted island, you can take one movie snack. I guess I know what it probably it's is. It's right there. It's the popcorn and the M and M's. Yeah. You can bring. I have a little more. No, I'm, I'm going, going to. <laughs> you can bring one other Milwaukeean on the deserted island besides your wife. <laughs> I was going to say. I'm going <laughs> to yeah, say my wife. I know. I'm not dumb. <laughs> <laughs> you can't take your wife, or maybe she's already there. You can bring one other Milwaukeean. Who is it? Um, one other Milwaukeean. 
I'm going to bring my, my brother who lives there. <laughs> oh, that's a good choice. Uh, either or, would you rather have an endless supply on the island of ice cream or of cereal? What cereal? You can choose the cereal and it comes with milk. Ice cream or cereal? Wait, can I have can I have cops frozen custard? Sure. Cops. <laughs> <laughs> what flavor? Um, wow. Well, I'd have this uh, <sighs> I'm making this stuff. Right? I know because because it's between three. It's between chocolate chip cookie dough with extra chocolate mm, chip cookie dough chocolate. Okay, yep. Tiramisu. Ooh. And this is good, uh, totally off the board. Maple syrup and pancakes. What? It's I've the, never had that one. I know. It's, it doesn't show up very really? often. It's only a few times a year. Yeah, it's delicious. I, I love Wow. Maple. I'm a real, I mean, I'm sitting here scarfing down M&M's. I'm a big sweet tooth, and I like maple candy and maple yeah, syrup. Yeah. I could like, I could pour maple syrup on a spoon and just eat it. So <laughs> it's really, it's Maybe you got to try selling that here. <laughs> <laughs> you can take one album. Oh, wow. One album. Well, that's impossible. <laughs> well, the island's not that big. I, oh, my gosh. All right, how about you could take the music of one artist, band, group? Whose music would you take? Whose would I take? Hmm. Um, it's got to be something your brother's going to like, too. He's going to be on the island. Yeah, I think it's the, well, if it's, you know, I would probably take, um, I would probably take the... Oscar Peterson. It's my, my Oscar Peterson record collection. <laughs> like my brother would really like that too. He's into Oscar and I'm into Oscar. And there's lots of great piano players too. I mean, I, I love jazz music. I can take. Yeah. I just take my jazz collection. Okay. Okay. Thanks. You can take one magazine subscription. <laughs> You'll get that magazine every month or every week, but you get just one magazine subscription. Oh, yeah, one magazine subscription. Well, I've got music. Yeah. Um. I would probably take. Uh, I'd probably take Sports Illustrated. That's good. Yeah. Okay. You Trying can, to be well rounded while I'm on the island. You can take either a six pack of beer, or your a bottle of your favorite Cabernet. I would take a bottle of my favorite Cabernet. Yeah, I think I would too. I'm, I like I like beer. I'm from Milwaukee. <laughs> <laughs> you can take one app that's currently on your phone. You can have your phone, but you only get one app. I only get one app. Uh, I'm going to cheat. I would take Feedly, which is what I use to read news. <laughs> and he, that's, so that's why you have Sports Illustrated. <laughs> that's right. Uh, PB&J or bologna sandwiches? Uh, okay, this is nuts. I don't like peanut butter. So I'm going bologna. That's an easy one for you. Uh, Greg, I want to wrap it up with this. What, what do you hope to accomplish in the future? What does a success, success, successful future look like for you? Oh, man. Uh... Continuing to grow our company and giving, giving, you know, so giving opportunities for all of our people to continue to grow, having success for myself, for our family. And, you know, I'm this really great guy. I don't it's about everybody else. No, I mean, <laughs> no, it's, it's, but it, like, it's, for, it's for me and for, for, for everybody and, and giving my kids opportunities, like giving, giving my kids this, you know, it's interesting for a long time. I thought I want to just give my kids the an opportunity I had because I mean, Let's face it, <laughs> I was really lucky. I mean, there's just, you know, very fortunate. There's no doubt about that um, on, on so many levels. You know, I was, I was given unto the, the understanding of an importance of an education, financial backing, mm -hmm. you know, a family who cared about me. I mean, there's so many things that I got that made me so fortunate that I, for the longest time, said, I just want to give my kids what I got. And then someone said, well, that's actually sort of playing defense. You actually want to give them more. You have to want to give them more or you won't even do that. And so mm -hmm. I want to be able to give them those opportunities so that they can, uh, do, do to, to, it's been, it's been, I've been tremendously fortunate even being here in Milwaukee and doing what I've been able to do and being with our business and giving back to being part of the community. And so I've been, I, I want to have them to have that op, that option. Hey, thank you very much for sure. having us in your theater. Thank you. Thanks Absolutely. for introducing me to the, the new snack, m and Popcorn. You won't be thanking me one if I go, why do you tell me about this? <laughs> I'm John Mercury. I'll see you next time in the next edition of Mercuria.